welcome to Grace Life Church Podcast. If you would like any more information about us, please visit our website, gracelife.com.au. If you have a Bible, James chapter 4 this morning, if you have a Bible, the book of James chapter 4. Praise God. If we haven't met, my name's Brett. I'm part of the preaching team here and I appreciate everyone that's in church today. Amen. Recently, I had the privilege and the pleasure to officiate the farewell and celebration service for Gary's dad, Derek. And out of that service and my time of officiating, I I preached a short Uh, message at the funeral but the testimonies that were given Gary spoke Gary's brother spoke Gary's uh, um, uh, uncle spoke as well and the amount of people were there I was impacted and I was encouraged and it was a great celebration of somebody's life who had lived for Jesus from my experience at that time and some other thoughts that have been provoked in me recently I went to this portion of scripture and I want to preach a message called the door to eternity and back in 1933 uh, January 5th 1933 the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco was they began uh, building that bridge and uh, it took four years it was a unique the unique aspect of the uh, bridge's construction is they put up a whole system of nets. Look at that guy hanging out there, right? If you look closely, you'll be able to see a system of nets that they put underneath the um, bridge construction because they were quite concerned that they were going to have a lot of people fall to their death. This system of nets did work, but the fact is, over the course of four years, 11 men fell to their death. Ten of those fell when the uh, scaffolding that they were using fell into net, broke the net. But there were 19 men who were saved in the safety net. These fortunate workers formed a club called the Halfway to Hell Club. And the founding member was a guy by the name of Al Zampa. And even though he was initially injured in the fall, he went on to live to the age of 95. My point here this morning is we don't walk around with a safety net underneath us. There is no guarantee of tomorrow for any one of us in this building right now. And I want to preach a message to you called The Door to Eternity from the, the, uh, from the letter of James, beginning in verse 13. And I'll just read from the New King James Version. It says, Come now, all you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapour that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and we shall do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. I want to talk to you firstly about the reality of eternity. We, uh, as a society, unfortunately, especially if you watch a lot of NCIS or any of those other crime shows, a little bit desensitised to the idea of death. People die on TV all the time. In fact, you can see about 25 in certain movies, all in about an hour and a half. Reality is, in 2011, in Australia, 147,000 people died. In 2020, 161,000. The fact is the death toll continues to rise as our population growth uh, continues to grow. In our scripture, James is pointing out a very stark reality. Leaving this world is real. Either through Jesus coming back, the rapture, or 
through death. Today or tomorrow, he says, you might say today or tomorrow, we're going to go to such and such a city. We may, there's all these ideas about living life, but I uh, want to just refer back to a time back in uh, Darwin when we were the assistant pastors in, the Darwin, in a Darwin church. And um, uh, it was uh, mid-1990s, there was a young guy, it was, uh, we were getting a lot of people come in and we had a, a guy came in who was about 24, 25 years old. This guy coming out of a drug background, he travelled from Victoria, came up to, Austra- up to Darwin and uh, just travelling around Australia and uh, he was a talented guy, musician, very good, but he got radically saved. I'm serious. He, he just, he left behind everything almost immediately as he became a believer in Christ and repented of his sin. His name was Chris Deer. Chris was such a good friend of uh, my sons and he was helping the young, younger guys in the church after a period of time. I think he was there in the church for about two years. One night we were having a church service and uh, Chris had to go home. He couldn't play the guitar anymore. So he, I, I, uh, uh, the senior pastor, I was the assistant, the senior said, can you go around and see how Chris is? So I went around and see how Chris was. Before he left church, I said, don't, uh, uh, before I left, after a, a visit with him, he was doing okay. I said, don't you die on me. The next morning, I get a call. I'm in the church office. Someone, uh, his girlfriend, his fiance is up at the hospital. She rings me up. She says, Pastor, you've got to come to the hospital. Chris has just passed away. He was in the uh, emergency clinic and uh, uh, here's a man with the call of God. I believe he had a call of God on his life. Here's a man who had uh, the grace of God. He knew the love of God. He, there were so many good things about Chris. There was so much, so much potential. And I was devastated as I came into that emergency clinic. I asked the nurses to get out. I pulled the curtain. The, the uh, fiancé and another lady from church were there. I said, let's try and raise him from the dead. So I began praying for this guy and I was dead set serious. I'm rebuking death. I'm casting out anything I can think of. I'm, I'm laying hands. I'm saying, Lord, you've got it. This guy's good, Lord. We need him. You know, I'm, I'm pleading with the Lord. It got very serious because nothing else happened except for one thing. After about 20 minutes, I stopped, we'd rested and then we started praying again. And I said, Lord, we need him back. And right at that time, the Lord showed me a door over his body and it was closing. And God said to me, he's gone through the door and he's not coming back. I never will forget that. I have never forgotten it and I never will. That literally I was standing at the door to eternity. Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and verse 12 says, For who knows what is good for man in life, all the days of his vain life, which passes like a shadow. Verse 14 in the New Living Translation says, Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while and then it's gone. That day I went back out into the car park and I wept as I sat in that car and thought I didn't have enough faith. But what God kept bringing me back to was the fact that He took him through the door of eternity. God took him at that time. It was, the, it was God's timing for him. What happened is his heart valve blew out and he was dead in six seconds. There was nothing anybody could do. But coming to grips with that and having come, coming to grips with the whole idea of passing out of this world is not always like we, what we want to talk about. We don't like talking about it too much. But we don't know how much time we got left. Acts chapter 7 talks about Stephen, who was a promising young man, call of God on his life, doing a great thing, goes out on an outreach to preach the gospel and ends up they, uh, being stoned by the religious people and he dies. What a shock that would have been to the church who were in the midst of a great revival at the time. God was doing powerful miracles and saving multitudes of people. The Bible describes our life as a shadow, a flower, a vapour. All have a sense of terminal or short. In our arrogance, we think we're, we're going to be fine. We don't think it's going to happen to us. 
Psalms 102 verse 11 says, My days are like the shadow that lengthens and I wither away like the grass. New Living Translation of Psalm 39, 4 and 5. It says, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. A man wrote a book called Beyond Death's Door. His name is Dr. Maurice Rawlings. He's a cardiologist and professor of medicine at a university in the U.S., and he conducted an extensive study. What he did is he, uh, there were a lot of people in the, in the uh, adjoining hospital who get resuscitated, flatline, and then get resuscitated. So he made it his business to interview these people as quickly as he could after they had passed and then come back being resuscitated. He wrote these findings down in his book called Beyond Death's Door, and he obtained all this information by uh, 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 immediately after these people had, re- uh, he was able to get to them. It's, he said these words, nearly 50% of a group of 300 initially interviewed reported la- uh, images of lakes of fire and brimstone, devil-like features, uh, figures, and other sights hailing from the darkness of hell. He says later these people changed their story because they were too ashamed to admit that they'd been to hell and back. They wouldn't even admit it to their families. And this was the comment that really got me. He said, he said, he concluded, just listening to these patients has changed my whole life. There's a life after death. And if I don't know where I'm going, it's not safe to die. My Bible says he's the God of the living and the God of... He, he, he determines when, when we die. He's the God of the living. We're alive today because we know that we have Christ, but there is a life beyond this day. So let's talk about planning your life because James says uh, that he talks about the fact, well, you should, should ask God if it's God's will for you to go here or there. Verse 13, I think, verse 14. And he says, what is your life? Even a vapour it vanishes away. Then verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or do that. I want to ask you about planning your life. Given the shortness of life and the fact that we don't know how long that life is that God has given us, what plans are you making? <laughs> I want to go back to Thailand. <laughs> my sight. I, I enjoyed my time there. But if the Lord wills, I'll make it. Luke chapter 15, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 12. Jesus addresses this issue a little bit. This is the man who has uh, got a farm. It's a fruitful farm. He's got plenty of things on there. And it says on there, verse 12, it says, And he said to him, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. Let me just pause there. Jesus is setting this up. He's, begin, he's going to talk about this man who, who has a farm and how he treats life a little bit uh, uh, casually. And uh, he says to him, listen, life's more than what you own, where you live, what you possess. So many people are focused on everything that we have and what we need and what's going to make us happy. I just got a new computer. I'm really happy. But guess what? It's got, not going to bring me the same joy as my wife or living for God or my grandchildren or, these, or having personal relationships. It's a thing. It's going to break down. So Jesus says, life is not about that. Verse 16, then he told him a story of a rich man with a farm and a fertile crop, right? Verse, tw- uh, verse 18, so he said, this is the rich man, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater and, uh, and there I will store my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink and be merry. Verse 20, but God said to him, fool, This night, your soul will be required of you. Verse 21 in the Living Translation says, Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, 
but not have a rich relationship with God. Our plans, whatever you're planning in life, are not necessarily all evil, but what I'm saying is you need to take time over how you plan your life. In our, in our text, James is challenging these Christians. He's challenging us as readers. He's saying, you make plans, but are these plans in the will of God? Verse 15, if the Lord wills, we shall do this or we shall do that. There's a couple of things that I just want to point out that we need to consider in the light of eternity. And the first one is some of your plans may never come to pass. I'm a bit of a dreamer. I have some wacky dreams sometimes, right? But as a kid, I always dreamed of flying. I'd, I'd, I'd just be running down the hill. This is one of my great dreams. I'd run down the hill, open up my arms, and the wind would catch me, and I'd fly. For many years, I had that dream. It was, it was fantastic. I used to love that dream. But I was offered to do a parachute jump one day. And nearing my, th I think it was my 30th, 40, okay. It was nearing my 40th birthday. And Joe says to me, we got the money. You can go and do a parachute jump. All of a sudden, the idea of flying had a different perspective on it. <laughs> so I started praying. Now, I'm serious. I, I might be laughing right now, but I'm, I started praying. I said, God, do you really want me to do this? <laughs> I seriously began to pray and I ultimately came to a very serious point. What's it for? What value is it in it? Is it evil? No. Is it good? Well, yeah, it's a thrill. And I decided not to parachute. So my plans of flying will have to wait to the rapture. <laughs> I also had plans when I was a kid. I wanted to play cricket for Australia. I never used sandpaper. Let me tell you that, right? <laughs> I had a plan to play rugby league for Australia. I was a mad sportsman. Guess what? None of those plans came to pass. I haven't flown. I haven't played for Australia in any sport. The reality is, and in a Christian sense, Life is short, therefore I need to make plans in accordance with God's will. Psalms 146 and verse 4 says, His spirit depart, he returns to the earth. In that day, his plans perish. It's talking about people who trust in man. He said, in the previous verse it says, Don't trust in princes, but put your trust in God. And he says, those people who put their trust in man, he says, your spirit departs one day, you, do, you, you return to the earth as in dust to dust, that sort of stuff. But in, the very, in that very day, your plans perish. Proverbs 19.21, there are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. It's like Katie. She wanted to go to, to, uh, uh, to uh, Myanmar, but in... In, in, in God's purpose, in God's plan, she got the bus uh, travelling in a direction, but God decided to change her plan. The danger is we begin to plan our lives with the thoughts of what we want rather than what God wants. Isaiah 30 and verse 1, Woe to you, rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel but not of me, and who devise plans but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. I thank God some of my plans haven't come to pass because I may not be where I should be today. Secondly, you need to make a plan. In a practical and real sense, we have, we have all been given a level of intelligence and gifting. Don't hide your gifting. I often wonder about people today in churches, where are all the missionaries? There was a time when we were churning them out. Same as Scotland. Scotland was one of the largest missionary countries for many years. They put out people all over the world. You don't hear about it too much in the Western world because we're so captivated with other things. We're all going to be accountable before God with the plans that we made. 
The parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, you can look at it all different ways, but the fact is some people bury their talent. The servant in that portion who had no plan was the, per, was the servant who also had to give accountability because he didn't apply himself. There are people today who live today for the day only with no real t- plan for the future, whether it's in regards to finances, health, family. Some people are just too casual about their future. I'm not saying stress. I'm just saying find what God has for you. Find what God has for you and do it. It's one of the greatest joys of my life to know that I'm in the will of God. If Jesus doesn't come back for 10, 20, 30 years, what are you planning to do? Go to Bali, man. I am going to Bali, by the way. (laughs) Proverbs 21.5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. Paul was planning his life, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things that I plan, do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be yes, yes, and a no, no. He's saying, listen, I take time over my plans. You can say, well, yeah, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He's a saint. Well, guess what? He's a man, a person just like you and I, and he had to give accountability to God. I would ask you today to seriously consider what are you doing with your life? Are you treading water or are you going in a direction that God is leading you? The pattern of people's, the people of God over the years who have achieved the most are those who have a real sense of eternity. They're about their father's business. Chuck Swindoll said this word. A 24-hour segment of time is never lived before and will never be repeated. You may never live to see another day like this one. You may never be closer to a decision you need to make, a step you need to take a sin you need to forsake. So do today what you should do before the sun sets and tomorrow's demands eclipse today's desires. Jesus said to Mary and Joseph when they went looking for him in the temple, he said, why do you you seek me? Did you not know that I'd be about my father's business? Can I ask you a question? You're about your father's business. Don't live with regret. You can change, you can't change the past, but you can make a difference for today and tomorrow. Finally, and everybody said hallelujah, get to the end. Confidence. Confidence for eternity. Psalms 90, verse 10, it says, The days of our lives are 70 years. Hello, Tom. Tom. And if by reason of strength they are 80, yet their boast is only labour and sorrow, for it is soon cut down, uh, cut off, and we fly away. Verse, nine, verse 12 of Psalm 90 says, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. One of the things I said to Tom before service is I'm going to embarrass him. I want to tell you, I honour this man. Because at his age, he could easily retire and kick back. But you know what he said to me in Thailand? You know what he said to me in India? I haven't got much time left. We need to do as much as I can. He's got a plan. He wants to do crusades anywhere in the world where he can, where he's got people that will be able to line up. He wants to invest in any missionary he can. That's why Katie was sitting here this morning. Because he's flown the flag for Katie. He says we need to get behind this girl because of what she's achieving. And we saw what she's achieving. I'm not embarrassing you, I'm honouring you, Tom Locker. You're a good man of God and I appreciate you. Give him a hand. In the light of eternity, he's planning to do more. And it's been my privilege that he's dragging me wherever he goes. Hallelujah. On a serious note, about 20 years ago, we were in Adelaide. 
and a friend of ours, uh, a pastor friend of ours, his mother, who had moved in with him, had um, become um, a little bit sick, but she was still okay at the time, but she knew that her time was short. She was in her 80s. Her name was Jerry, Jerry Sherrock. She had uh, served the Lord since she was young. I think she was a teenage, late teenager when she gave her life to Christ. And she pulled me in and she asked her son, um, Scott, to get me to come and talk to her. When I came into the room, she said, I really want you to do my farewell service. I don't want my son to do it. I want him to have time to um, mourn and, and just, and just do the, be at the funeral. I said, yeah, no worries. I'll help you out. So we talked about what she wanted. She wanted amazing grace. She wanted an altar call. She wanted a straight gospel message. This lady was on fire for God, filled with the Holy Spirit in her 80s and still got a real fire in her. But listen to one statement she made. She said, every time I think of death, I smile and laugh a little because I know I'm going to be with Jesus. I tell you, listening to this lady, sp spending time with this lady, it's, it gave me confidence for eternity. You and I today can have confidence for eternity. You and I can go through that door of eternity with a confidence in our heart because of what Jesus Christ has done for you and I. Yeah, we don't know how long our life is. We don't know what, what's going to transpire. There are no guarantees. We fear the process of death, but tell, let me tell you this, death is merely walking out of this life and into the next. It's walking through the door of eternity where we're going to live forever in the presence of God, where we're going to live forever in the love of God. Oh my goodness, where we're going to be in a place where there's no more tears. Our confidence is based on the Word of God and God, Almighty God Himself. This is not philosophy. This is not speculation. And for the thousands of years, countless numbers of believers have planned their lives in the light of eternity because they have confidence in their God and His Word. Confidence to go through the door because we're a Christ follower. This confidence about life and death should li help you live your life daily. Not with fear, but with confidence in who we serve. This is not to say that we won't suffer sickness or struggles in life, but rather the Bible-believing Christian knows ultimately our destination is eternity with Christ. I looked up that song of When the Saints Go Marching In. I remember in the 80s, we used to march around church to that song. And when they march around the throne, or when they march around the throne, oh, oh Lord, I want to be in that number. When they march around the throne. You know, that was in the, I think it was the 1830s. St. Kilda has stolen it, but they don't sing it very often. <laughs> but the saints of God, hallelujah. I, I, I really felt like, getting out and doing the march this morning and I thought I haven't even primed these guys so, they, so we'd be doing an acapella and we don't do acapella that good but anyway the issue is I'm looking forward to marching around the throne what did, Christ, what did Paul say about this whole thing he said to live is Christ but to die is what gain there is no fear there is no reason to fear what is beyond death at the door of eternity. We're going to heaven, glory to God. We're going to be with God's people. We're going to be with God and the angels. My goodness, I think I'll even fly in heaven. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. That's why Paul said in these, these words in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 57, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our, our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We are victorious Christians. Maybe we go through struggles here. Maybe we get sick. I can't guarantee anything for you. This isn't a prosperity doctrine. This is a a sincere understanding that doesn't matter what happens here, it is only for a short period of time compared to eternity. But we get hung up, don't we? We get hung up. I hope we don't have to go through another COVID situation, but we may. Megalomaniacs trying to control our life. Governments enforcing certain things. I don't know the future. Congratulations if you do. But let me tell you, it don't matter to me. Ultimately, I'm going to heaven. That's the confidence. That's the confidence that we have. Listen to 2 Peter 1, verse 8. It says, The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about growing as a Christian. Then listen to this. Verse 11, 2 Peter 1, 11. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Oh, grand entrance. I like that idea. I like the idea of marching into heaven victorious. I'm not going defeated. I'm going victorious. And I don't know when that is. And I'm a young fella. Can you say amen, Tom? (laughs) I am a young fella. I still got plenty of life in me, but that doesn't mean I can guarantee tomorrow. But I do know that if I do go, it's not a time to mourn. It's a time to rejoice. What did Billy Graham say? Someday you will hear, I'm sorry, you'll read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't believe a word of it. I shall be more alive then than I am now. I will just have changed my address. I will have gone into the presence of God. That's confidence. That is the confidence I want to instill in you today. Live for God with all your heart, your mind and soul, but have that confidence that no matter what happens, you can go into eternity into a great and glorious place called heaven and God's kingdom. Do you know Jesus as your personal saviour today? Have you got that confidence in your heart? Because you can have it before you leave this service today. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast from Grace Life Church. For more information about us or any of our services, please visit our website at gracelife.com.au.